All right. Hey, welcome back, everyone. I'm Pastor Russell Labar. Now you see my face. You didn't earlier, um, but here I am. So uh, today is Mission Sunday. We here at Penyan Assembly of God, uh, we support missionaries by way of kind of adopting them. We do it a little differently than, uh, you know, perhaps some other churches where uh, the board kind of decides this is how much of our budget is going to go to missions. And uh, so what we do is we have our missionaries come out, and when they're itinerating, they come and they share. And how we've started since I've pastoring here is uh, when our missionaries come, we give them the whole service, and uh, we have a brisket and uh, barbecue and a full spread of delicious food. Um, And we were supposed to have John Ganan here today. Um, which means we were supposed to have brisket and roast pork today, but unfortunately, that's not on the menus. So uh, I guess there'll probably be hot dogs later. I'm not sure. But um, anyhow, uh, when our missionaries come, we as families and individuals uh, pledge, make pledges, faith pledges that we will support these missionaries for X amount of dollars every month. And that typically goes, there's some commitments that are to one year, some are four years. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we do things. So uh, if you are a, uh, <coughs> a member here or you have pledged to do so uh, to support missionaries, then I encourage you to, um, to send that money in. You can do that via PayPal, but if you do, uh, I would encourage you to make it for more than your pledge because we do have to pay a certain little fee for transferring money over PayPal. So uh, we want to give the missionaries all the money, and, and we have been able to do so and actually above and beyond the pledges in the last two quarters. So, um, okay. Okay. Okay, so there is a there is a box to click. Jared tells me that uh, that it's not a payment or for a service or a fee or anything like that. That if you click that box, then uh, PayPal absorbs that s- service fee. So, um, so that's something that you can do. Uh, but with it being Mission Sunday, uh, we have an update from John and Katie Ganan uh, that John put together for us. So. Uh, Jared's going to get that up, and then we'll uh, get into the sermon after that. Hello from the Ganans, Pen Yan AG. John and Katie here. Tessa, Grayson, and also Carlos. We get to do what we get to do because of you across New York State to help students know Jesus. We can't do it without you. Thanks for letting us do what we get to do. Uh, this year, we were able to bring Reggie Dabbs to a few thousand students in Syracuse. um, And we were able to go to Henniger High School and and present a message of hope. Uh, You can check out that video. Now, Reggie is a minister. Uh, He serves in an Assemblies of God church. We connected Reggie not only with the high school, but also to an evening event uh, called Syracuse Tour at Destiny USA, where 575 students and leaders from youth groups across New York, uh, across Central New York, uh, came out and heard the gospel, and 79 of those students responded from those 25 local churches. They responded and made decisions for Jesus that night. So this year we brought on a missions intern named Kate. You may remember Kate as one of our very first campus missionaries who started her very own club in New York, right in Niagara Falls. So during this time, Kate has been collecting student stories from where Youth Alive has made connection with youth ministries that mobilize their youth into campus missions in their middle schools and high schools. And you can check out some of those stories uh, listen to this story of a student. And so once again, my advisor heard my speech because she was in the room and she went to the principal and told her about it. Well, not the principal, the assistant principal and told her about it. And the next day I got called down to the assistant principal's office. <laughs> I was really scared. Speaking thought, about forgiveness. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, did I do anything wrong? I don't think I did anything wrong. And it was like, just my mind was racing while I was going down there. And yeah. I was just like, probably because my club 
but it's whether that the news is good or bad, which scares me. <laughs> so I went down there and she was just like, you're the, um, you're one of the leaders of Jolt, right? And I was like, yes, I am. And she explained to me that my advisor had come down and told her about what I said on forgiveness and how wow. she felt like it was very powerful and how she wanted more people to hear it because our school has a lot of fights. Yeah. There's um, a lot of hatred between students mm -hmm. and um, a lot of resentment to teachers. And she said that she felt if the students heard this speech on forgiveness, maybe it will bring a wave of revival into wow. the school. One teacher in Rochester prayed that she would see a club start in her classroom and students started the club and now she has a front row seat to what God's doing. Kids are coming to Christ in this high school classroom. Check out this video. So we are going to continue our work renewing students, schools, and communities by connecting the church to the school. Thank you for partnering with Youth Alive. We're going to see every student, every school reach with the message of hope together. All right. John's, uh, John's a great guy. I've gotten a chance to really get to know him over the last few years. And uh, the work that they, they're doing connecting churches and students and, um, and getting these clubs going and all of that is just uh, it's fantastic. And really, it's, it's one of those things where I was part of a cohort with them and just you know really brainstorming how we can serve our schools, how we can love our schools, and um, really to... Not necessarily um, to with the the primary goal of of proselytizing or evangelizing even, but to just be the body of Christ, to be a representation of Jesus to these these children and to these teachers, and uh, that's something where um, they're doing an amazing work, and uh, and I'm thankful for that. So. Uh, I just want to take a minute uh, before we get into the sermon to pray for our missionaries and then also to pray for the sermon. So, Father, I just thank you, God, for all of those uh, missionaries that are out there serving you, God, and in these trying times. I know we have a number of missionaries that are in foreign countries uh, that are uh, dealing with, with things in, in different ways, with everything that's going on. So they're, you know, they've had a lot of experience. Some people have had to, um, over the course of the last few months, make their way back home as countries basically told the missionaries they had to leave until this whole thing passed. So God, I just pray that you would be with our missionaries today, that God, you would give them a special touch of your presence, God, that you would just strengthen them and bring renewal to them, God, that you would just lead them into a season of refreshing in your spirit, and that, God, you would just minister your grace to them in a powerful, powerful way. And Father, I just pray now for the sermon portion of our service this morning, God. I just, I offer myself to you. God, I offer to you, yield to you, my ears, my eyes, my mind, my heart, my lips, my words. Father, I pray that you would just lead me and guide me in what it is you want me to say, what, what you want people to hear. Father, I pray that, that as this message goes out, that, Father, you would, you would let your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, that your will would be done in each and every one of our lives, God, that your kingdom authority would come upon our hearts, the peace that comes with your presence would come upon our hearts and our lives. That, God, you would bring order where there is disorder. You would bring joy where there is sorrow. Hope where there is despair. God, that your kingdom rule and reign 
would be recognized and realized in kitchens, in bedrooms, in living rooms, out on decks and porches, out in parks, different places all over this morning. Father, I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your faithfulness. You're so good. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, for the sermon this morning, I had this, uh, this portion of Scripture, this chapter of Scripture, really to narrow it down, two verses out of a chapter of Scripture that God dropped in my heart a couple weeks ago. And it's really um, been that scripture that's been on the, the back burner meditation in my mind anytime I'm not preparing for uh, one of the Monday, Wednesday, or Friday lunch things or, you know, reading something else. This has been kind of that thing that's been, it's just been perking inside of me. And it's one of those things where I really felt like this Sunday was the Sunday to preach this sermon. Uh, the title of this sermon is Trust Issues trust issues. So this morning we're talking about trust issues. And you know, um, outside of, of even everything that's going on in our, our society right now, I think a lot of us in some form or another have a certain level of trust issues, right? It's something that, you know, we've all been betrayed. We've all been done wrong. Somebody that we placed our trust in has let us down, right? But taken across into where we're at right now, we're in this um, information age. There's this barrage of all sorts of information. There's all sorts of confusion. There's all sorts of, of um, disarray out in our society right now in regards to um, all manners of things. Uh, but it's something where, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to know, you know, who do we trust? Whose word do we trust? Who do we look to? What do we listen to? You know? And unfortunately, an unfortunate thing is that even within the church, we have some people that are like, I, oh, I trust this source. And another person says, I trust this source. And another person says, oh, I trust this source. And I don't like what your source does because it doesn't fit my narrative. And, and there's, there's all this division. And I'm saying, people, this should not be. And, you know, there's a, a reality that, you know, for a lot of people, there's a real and present danger, and there's, there's real threats, and there's real concerns that, that are valid, right? And sometimes it's hard to know where do we place our trust, because really, push come to shove, we've all even sometimes placed our, our trust in a source or pra- placed our trust in a bit of information only to find out that that information was proved false, and then we're wrong. And, and that really sucks, too. I mean, I've been there. Um, so, you know, none of us really want to be in that place of embarrassment, that place of um, having our trust betrayed. And you know what? We're not alone. It's one of those things where in this portion of Scripture that I found, there was a people that, you know, there was real and present dangers that were going on around them. There were things that were happening in their country. We're going to be looking in Isaiah and the, the two portions of Scripture, uh, or two books in the Old Testament, rather, that we're going to be looking at are in Isaiah and in Second Kings. And just to kind of give this a little context of what was going on. So in this time, the, the kingdom of Israel had fractured. It had split into two. You had the northern kingdom and you had the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. So they had separate kings. And there was all this, um, all this dissension, all of this brokenness. And there was, uh, if you read through the kings, there's time and time again, this king did evil in the sight of the Lord. But then this king came along and he, he cleansed all the idols and he broke down the high places and, and he was a righteous king. But then the next king was twice as bad as the one that was before him and and uh, it's just kind of this back and forth, and it seemed like there was just this cycle of good king and three bad kings, and maybe another good king. So it was just a really fractured time. There was a lot of division in between the northern and the southern kingdoms. 
there was uh, information. It wasn't obviously information didn't travel at the speed that it does today. But you know, rumors still travel pretty darn quick, um, even in that time where uh, the news of this would spread to here and there. And to bring that up to uh, where we're at now and where we're going to be looking at today, uh, the kingdom of Assyria under King Sennacherib, had, um, they had begun to conquest. They were conquering places left and right. And Israel uh, had had prophets sent to them that told them, God told them, listen, you've got to turn away from your idols. You've got to put these things down. You've got to stop doing these things. And Israel decided that they were not going to listen to God. They decided they were going to continue to hold on to their idols until God brought the judgment of Assyria upon them and carried a bunch of them off into exile, left some of them behind just basically to, to rule as like a vassal leader that were still under the control of the king of Assyria. But Judah still stood as a kingdom on its own. It had not been conquered by by Assyria. Um, Egypt still stood at that time. And as the real and present danger of this threat was coming nearer, uh, the people of Israel started taking action. And, and the king, even before King Hezekiah, which is who we're going to kind of be talking about today, um, they were placing their trust in the wrong places. So I'm going to go ahead and read this. Uh, whole chapter, and then I'll bring out the verses that really just settled in my heart. So in Isaiah chapter 30, God says, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt. Egypt's shade for refuge, but Pharaoh's protection will be your shame. Egypt, Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in zone and their envoys have arrived in Hanes, everyone will be put to shame because of, people use, of a people useless to them who bring neither help nor advantage, but only shame and disgrace. So God's saying, listen, you're going to Egypt for help. When I didn't tell you go, to go to Egypt, you're going, you're, you're trusting, you're placing your trust in Egypt, and I didn't tell you to place your trust in Egypt. You should place your trust in me. So he goes on and he uh, talks, basically talks more about how Egypt is going to prove to be a useless ally, that they're really not going to do anything. And then he has Isaiah write it down and inscribe it on a scroll that... Um, these, these people, are, they're unwilling to listen to my instruction. And how they ask, they say, you know, see no more visions. And, and to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path and stop confronting us with this Holy One of Israel. I mean, that was the attitude of the people of Judah uh, leading into this time before uh, the downfall of Israel and or around that same time when Israel fell, but before Hezekiah really came into power. So then he, the Lord goes on and says, this is what the, the Holy One of Israel says, because you've rejected this message, relied on depression, oppression and depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging. It collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. It's like it'll be ground into powder. But here's this, here's this verse that really, it, it just jumped out at me. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. What's he talking about there? He's talking about a returning to the Lord. When he's talking about repentance, he's talking about a returning. Of the different versions I looked at, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the King James says returning, and the New Living, in returning to me more, um, more uh, specifically, NIV says the 
repentance. So God's saying, listen, in returning to me, in resting in me, you will find your salvation in quietness. In quietness and trust, you will find your rest. And the last part of that verse says, but you would have none of it. And it says, you know, they said, we'll flee on horses. He said, therefore you will flee. You will ride off on a swift horses. Your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee. And the threat of one and threat of five, you will all flee away till all you are, till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. And to kind of give this a little further, to carry this further, if we were to carry it further into Isaiah, we would find the, um, the same instance here in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37, where Isaiah is prophesying and, and dealing with King Hezekiah. But we're going to go to 1 Kings. So we have Hezekiah and He's sitting as king, and it says that he began to reign. He was 25 old years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Not talking about his father David per se, but his, as King David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze state snake that Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Isn't that interesting? Even this symbol that was, it was a historic symbol. It was a tradition. It was something that, that they held dear because it, it was a reminder of what they had experienced in the wilderness. And, and the bronze snake, when they were in the wilderness and there was these serpents that were going through the, and, and biting people, only when they turned to this thing that Moses made, this bronze snake on a pole that was lifted up, were they healed that very thing that had been a place of salvation became a stumbling block. I just found that really, really interesting as I was reading through that. But it says that Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept his commands. The Lord had given Moses and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria, and he did not serve him. So he, he stood against the king of Assyria. If we carry this story a little further, Sennacherib threatens Jerusalem. He comes to him and he says, you know, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says, I'm, I'm what are you basing this confidence of yours? Why are you so confident? You say you have the counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. Of whom on, on whom are you depending? Do you rebel against me? Look, I know you're depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. But if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed? saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this one altar in Jerusalem. Come now, make a bargain, bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. So they're basically, they're scoffing. They're saying, wait, you're trusting in God? And they brought to light, too, the fact that they were trusting on Egypt, that they had placed their trust in, in Egypt. And they brought to light the fact that, that Egypt was not going to offer them any help as well. But what they wrongly understood was that 
in Hezekiah destroying those high places and Hezekiah ripping down those other altars and shrines and coming and bringing it back to the one true God and that one true altar that he had ordained that they had somehow upset God. When in reality, that was an act of obedience and honoring God. So this message, uh, they were the the king's men, Hezekiah's men replied that you know we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna do that. The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. So word was brought back to Hezekiah and in the beginning of 19, 2 Kings 19, King Hezekiah heard this. He tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and he went from the temple of the Lord. When he was put in a place where there was a real and a present danger, there was, there was a threat that was being made against him, what did he do? He didn't place any further trust in Egypt. He didn't put trust in, in the might of his own hand or in his own wisdom or any of those things. What he did was he got on his face before the Lord. But then Isaiah comes along. I know I'm skipping around here. There's a whole lot of, you know, you got Hezekiah's prayer in here. Actually, Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the word Snackerb has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations in their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wooden stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. So then Isaiah goes on to prophesy the fall of Sennacherib. And everything comes true just like Isaiah said it would. So, here we have this Old Testament, right, situation where we have, um, I'm going to go ahead and stand up, Jared, so you can uh, adjust and not get just my chest. But, um, we have this this situation where the people are in disarray, the nations are in disarray, the rumors are floating around, the information's floating around. Listen, haven't you not heard what Assyria did to the northern kingdom? Haven't you heard what they did to the other areas all around us? Haven't you heard? And yet Hezekiah decided that he was going to heed the words of the earlier prophecy. He was going to heed the words that say, in returning in rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and trust, you will find strength. And I've been thinking about that, mulling on that, okay, God, what are you trying to say? What does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with my life? Because that's one of those things where when I'm preparing a sermon and my first question is, okay, God, what are you trying to speak to me? What are you trying to, to say to me? What do you need to do in me through this sermon? What is it that you're trying to tell me? There is news abroad everywhere that instills nothing instills nothing but fear and doubt and paranoia. There is, it's, it's impossible, it seems, to get any sort of news anywhere that doesn't. There's information coming from every different direction, and it's hard to know who to trust, if anybody. And I've really felt like the Lord's been saying to me, in returning to me, Repentance, you know, repentance, I think sometimes it's not just, you know, a, a matter of 
when we sin, although that is primarily what it is, when we repent, when we're, we're going away from God, turning around and going back towards God. But I believe there's a, a returning to Him. You know, when we're looking at the situation, when we're looking at things and giving these things too much time, there's a returning to Him that needs to happen. So I've had to literally take myself in my hand in some ways, um, as, as odd as that might sound. But, but, you know, like David said, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? He talked to himself like that and all the time. You know, tr- put your hope in God. Put your trust in God. Why are you letting your mind be filled with all of this information? Why are you focusing on the division? Why, when you can be trusting in me, are you trusting in these things? In returning to me and rest, you will find salvation. In quietness and trust, you will find your strength. The message puts it this way. God, the Master, the Holy One of Israel, has this solemn counsel. Your salvation requires you to turn back to me. And stop your silly efforts to save yourselves. Your strength will come from settling down in complete dependence on me. Complete dependence on me, trusting in me, settling down. It was just uh, Friday night or last night, I can't remember which. Um, Lord just kind of impressed on me, you know, and it it might be true for some of you out there as well, you know, have you been quiet? Have you taken the time to rest? Like, it's something that I've felt since before this started that, man, God, God is, is going at God's pace, and I feel like we're going at a pace that's 90 miles an hour, and I've mentioned this before, that, that we have a chance before us, we have an opportunity before us to, to slow down. But then God hit me with, have you slowed down? Now, if I'm completely honest, I've been going faster than before this started. I've been busier than before this started. I've been preparing more, I've been praying more, I've been doing things, you know, the things that are required to be doing what I'm doing. And I've been perhaps engaging in silly efforts to save myself, to figure things out. You know, what's this going to look like when we come out the other side of this? What's, what, how am I going to lead? How am I going to, what's, what's it going to look like? And God reminded me just this morning during worship of a time before I knew that I was going to be a pastor, before I even thought that I was going to be a pastor, when my current situation was in a whole lot of upheaval. I was part of a business I didn't want to be a part of. I, did, I was miserable in it. I was going to ministry school, and, um, and I was looking towards a future that was totally uncertain. In a number of times, pe- different people uh, that didn't know the si- some knew the situation, some didn't know the situation, shared the same prophetic word to me. Stop trying to figure it out. You need to trust in me. Place your trust in me. So my future is secure in him. Your future is secure in him. And when we settle down, when we rest in him, when we place our trust in him, that's where we find our salvation. That's where we find our strength. And I know, I know it's hard. I know it's hard to, to do that with everything that, you know, we're all having to deal with. But the fact of the matter is that when you can't trust anything else, when you can't even trust yourself, you can trust God. You can trust his word. The days we're living in, you can read about those in there too. 
But I'll warn you, you might not necessarily like it. So, back up again. So, um, so, where's the good news in this, right? Well, Hezekiah went on to continue to reign for quite a few more years, and it was a number of kings after Hezekiah before the rest of that initial prophecy that I read came true. The walls crumbled, and they were set to scatter, and they were overcome, although it wasn't by Assyria who they thought it was going to be. It was by Babylon. Um, but where's the, you know, the New Testament good news in this, right? Well, initially, in repentance, in rest, you will find salvation. Where's that? That's in Jesus Christ. He puts meaning to our repentance. He has made a way for us to turn from our sins and to enter in to full and fulfilling relationship with God, a restored relationship with God. So in repentance and rest, what did Jesus say? Come unto me, all you are who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. Right? You will find rest for your souls. And I feel like this really, that encompasses this in a lot of ways. You know, stop trying to save yourself. Settle down. Rely in complete dependence on me. But I read this last night. This is in 1 Peter. Talks a lot about trust in 1 Peter. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by His great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on this last day, on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him, even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. We go forward a little further here to verse 21, First Peter 1. Through Christ you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters and love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal, living Word of God. So you might be out there and you might not know who to trust. And you might be thinking, why should I even trust you? I don't know. Don't trust me. Trust the word. Don't trust me. Trust God. You know, because that's where we find our strength. That's where we find our salvation. You know, how does this how does it apply to you and I when we're, we're confronted by fearful things? Put your trust in God. Hold on a little while longer. Your financial situation is dire. Trust in God. I've seen money come from places that I never would have thought it would. Put your trust in God. 
things in your own spiritual walk or you're, you're stumbling, you're struggling, you're having a hard time, in repentance and rest, you'll find your salvation. Put your trust in God. And then, back to the main text in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. I just love this. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, He will rise up and show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice and blessed are those who wait on Him, who put their trust in Him. That word longs. Like, can you even just, like, have you ever longed for something? I know a lot of us, that's something we all got in common. Man, we are longing for the day when we can all be together in this room again. We are longing for the day when we can go out and, and we can, you know, sit around a table in a restaurant and, with some friends and, and have a good time and have some fellowship. We're longing for the day when, um, when all of this is kind of past. Those of us in the, in the Northeast, we've been longing for this sunshine. That, that deep longing. Just imagine for a second the God of the universe, the almighty God who spoke everything to, into existence longs to show you grace. He longs to be gracious to you. He longs to rise up and pour out his compassion upon you, to show you his compassion. He longs for it. He's passionate for you to put your trust in Him. And this morning, if, if you're a follower of Jesus already, you've probably experienced this time uh, and time again over the course of your journey with Him where um, there's times where you misplace your trust and you have to keep coming back to Him and placing your trust in Him. Every day is a new day. His mercies are new every morning, and He longs to be compassionate and show His grace to you. But if you're out there and, and it's hard for you to wrap your head around the fact that there, there's a trustworthy God out there that wants to give you salvation. He wants to give you strength. He wants to rescue you. He wants to give you new life. If you have a hard time with that, that's okay. Don't let the hard time that you're having with that hold you back from encountering Him in a real way. You see, it says, through Jesus Christ, our repentance has traction because our repentance from our sins and our efforts to gain our own salvation, to be good enough, we can't be good enough. I can't be good enough. You can't be good enough. None of us can be good enough. But because of his great love for us, for his grace for us, he chose to send his son to die for us, to raise to new life so that we could have new life, so that, he, so that we could spend eternity with him. You can trust him. And when you do... He will find salvation. He will find strength. And He will turn His compassion upon you. He will rise up and pour it out on you because He longs to do it. So as I wrap up this morning, I'm just going to... Those, those out there, maybe uh, even if it's not in real time right now, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Uh, you don't know... Jesus in a real and a personal way. You've never had an encounter with the Almighty God. And you're just, you're not really sure about this, but you, you know that something in you tells you this just makes sense. That God's trustworthy. That God loves me. I want to I wanna pray, and you can just pray this in your own, in your own words. And just kind of lead you in that. And if, if you 
do that, whether it's in real time today or maybe a, a week, a month, a year later, whatever that is, reach out, please. Uh, let us know. So, uh, let's pray. Father, I just, uh, I come to you, God, and, and I thank you that we can trust in you. We I thank you that no matter how deep our trust issues go, that we can place our trust in you. <clears throat> no matter how varied the information is and no matter how um, unreliable uh, other things might be, you are completely reliable. <clears throat> God, I just, I pray right now, God, for, for those out there that are, um, they want to trust in you. They want to place their trust in you. They've never placed their trust in you before. God, I want to lead them and help them along in their encounter with you. So God, I pray that, that when they pray along, God, that you would touch them in their spirit, that you would make them know that they are, they are walking into new life. that you would fill them with your presence, that your presence and your spirit would not only fill them, but you would come upon them and you would baptize them in your spirit right off the bat. So if that's you, you're out there and you, you want to place your trust in God, just in your own words. God, I know that there's nothing I can do to measure up to your holy standard. I know that that I've, I've walked contrary, I've lived contrary to your standard in my life prior to now. And I know that I will continue to get it wrong. But God, I, I've heard that, that you made a way for me to have salvation. You made a way for me to enter into a restored relationship with you that's broken by sin. Because you paid the price for me. You're Jesus Christ through his sacrifice on the cross. That you've conquered sin and you've conquered death and that because of his resurrection, my, my old life can be put to rest and I can ra be raised to new life in you. God, I want to put my trust in you. I want to receive the salvation that you promised. God, I want to have an encounter with you. I want to know you in a real and a personal way. And start on this journey of walking with you for the rest of my days. Father, for those that are out there that, you know, they've perhaps entered into misplaced trust and let, let fear take over God. I pray, Father, that you would help them to return to a place of trust and security in you in knowing that in, in repentance and rest they will find their salvation. That in quietness and trust. They will find their strength. God, I ask that you would help me, help them to come into the place of quiet. It's one thing to be still before you, God. It's, it's another thing entirely to, to be quiet. So God, I pray that you would quiet our minds, quiet our hearts, to the point where we can actually hear you speak to us. Because God, we want to hear from you. We want to be assured and reassured by your voice that we can trust in you. Even though we know we can, we believe that in faith. Thank you that we can we can call you our God and that you are longing to, 
be gracious to us and to pour compassion upon us, God. I pray that you would do that for us today. And that we would receive it with open arms and open hearts as you minister to our hearts, our souls, our minds, our emotions. I just thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, everyone, I uh, pray that you are able to enjoy the sunshine if you were in the uh, upstate New York area and um, and everything. Enjoy this beautiful weather we got today and, and uh, stay safe out there. And I'm longing for the day when we can be together again. And that day's coming soon. So love you all. Farewell. Letting go of every single dream I lay each one down at your feet Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I've tried to win this war, I confess My hands are weary Your body.